That's why I love science. It, it brings people together. It doesn't matter your nationality, your culture, yeah. your religion or anything. Science is universal. Science, you know, bridges those gaps. And like if, if people just have curiosity and want to know, want to understand, you can, you can triumph over any, any other problems. I can't think of any more human activity than conducting science experiments. The game I play is a very interesting one. It's imagination in a tight straitjacket. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. What I always think should be the basis of education is not answers, but questions. We should teach kids how to question. Yep, so I'm James Ferguson. I'm a genomic systems analyst uh, for the Genomic Technologies Group at the Garvin Institute. Um, and my day-to-day -day stuff is uh, mostly bioinformatics and looking at the latest cutting-edge technology that can help uh, further the current goals of the Garvin Institute of being one of the best research institutes in the world. Yeah, that's cool, because we actually um, had two of your friends uh, and one of your colleagues on the podcast. So Indeed. way back in the day, um, actually one of my friends as well, we had Martin Smith, Dr. Martin Smith on. I think that was episode four. Um, Good memory, Alex. And he's, uh, five, yeah, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah. I might have been five. Oh, there you go. That's well, why you forgot the cable. Facts would, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was trying to, I was trying to work that out the whole time. Um, and um, and he's actually, is your, he your boss now? He is moment? my boss, Yeah, yes. there you go. And um, we also had Meow Ludo on as well. Yes, Meow. What episode was that? Uh, seven and eight. Oh, there you go. What a pro. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so Martin can claim that he got in there first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't you maybe tell us a little bit about what your research group actually does here? Because we talked when we talked with Martin, we talked about uh, the research into long non-coding RNAs, which is really interesting. Yep. But you just dropped this big term, bioinformatics, right? Yes. A and developing technologies. So, um, so how is your research group focused around those two kind of things? So, since uh, genomic, well, uh, ge genetic sequencing platforms have really uh, taken uh, biology by storm, uh, first with the massive Illumina sequencing platforms that have just been allowing um, people to look at cancer genomes and interrogate for different diseases, the the Garvin has a rather large platform, the uh, X10 platform. Um, and you know our group was was built to look at well what what's what's next what's the next upcoming technology what's the next upcoming uh, uses of technology how can we improve on those develop new techniques new tests um, to help patients and understand uh, uh, biology and help other researchers mm. so uh, at the moment we're heavily invested into nanopore sequencing which is a new kind of sequencing it it uh, detects DNA or RNA by um, where the, the DNA or RNA will go through a small nanopore. And uh, as it goes through, it detects a, a difference in ionic current. And so for, for each of the uh, bases, the nucleic, yeah. nucleic acid bases, it detects a different ionic current. And that's how it can sequence it because they all have unique current signature yes and, yeah. well it, it's a little more complicated than that it has, it's it's a group of of bases but from that we can infer what the individual bases are oh, uh, okay. and and it's a, t a it's a new type of sequencing so it comes with new techniques of in investigating and anal analyzing that data to get specific information out one of the biggest advantages of it is that the the lengths of the reads you can get is next to unlimited and we, we were the first to, to sequence a, a whole mega base in yeah, a single well, read we've actually got that on here um, yep. <laughs> yeah yeah well 
Uh, well, maybe we'll get to that in a yeah. little in a little bit because I think we need to we back up a little bit and yeah. and talk about bioinformatics. Like what is that. what is bioinformatics? Because yeah. a lot of our listeners are probably undergrad students, and a lot of them are um, early undergrad students, and they didn't even know what bioinformatics is. Yeah. Or well, they they're in the same boat as I was two years ago, yeah. uh, where I'd never even heard of the term. Um, and I was introduced to it very quickly and fell in love with it straight away. Uh, it's the merging of computer science, statistics, mathematics, and uh, biology. And it's, it's a way of uh, analyzing and interpreting biological data. Yeah. Um, and this can come in lots of forms, looking at um, what Martin would have been talking about, the structure of RNA, for example. Uh, it can be looking at um, you know, finding mutations in, in, in genomes. And those mutations can um, lead to certain types of diseases. Uh, so picking those up early can help us prevent them. Mm. Uh, for example, in breast cancer and ovarian cancer, or for example, Huntington's disease, um, which is an expansion of three bases over and over again. And if the expansion is long enough, say past 36 repeats, mm. then there's a high probability they'll uh, develop the disease. But then that there's moral questions of whether or not you test yeah. people for that. But mm. um, And, you know, it's... Uh, it's a relatively new branch of science and you know back in the day it was one by a petition to a many many biologists mm. um, but now uh, if you look at this place and uh, the Garvin and the Kinghorn Center um, our bioinformatics uh, team is growing rapidly yeah. um, it's very much it's almost taking over a lot uh, of our biology a lot of that um, and correct me if I'm wrong but a lot of that would be increases in uh, in computing power as well, I'd imagine, wouldn't it? Because we have, the, I guess, the reason why bioinformatics is so important to biology is because genomes are very large and and they're cell-specific often. Oh, well, their, expre their expression is cell-specific. Um, so having a way to have to analyze all that data is really important. So if you get a cancer which might have different cell populations in it, how do you work out what the expression of those genes are in all of those different cell populations without some way to interrogate large data sets. And I guess that's where bioinformatics kind of really comes in. Exactly. Uh, so if you go from the beginnings to what you were just saying then, which goes into single cell analysis, uh, in the beginning, it was about um, understanding protein sequences from uh, Frederick Sanger. Um, and it was Margaret Dayhoff, uh, who was described as the mother and the father of bioinformatics. She uh, was a, a biophysicist, and she wrote th some of the first algorithms to look at sequence alignment um, of proteins. She in invented the single letter representation of amino acids, uh, and, she, and she did that to reduce space because it was a punch card computer system. Uh, so it was, Pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and her daughter went on to um, uh, do work in uh, neural networks. Rather interesting family. Mm -hmm. um, but then you go from there all the way to now where we have, you know, protein sequences can be, you know, they're a little bit long and you, in interrogating databases of that can, you needed uh, computational help. It was too difficult to do by hand. Mm -hmm. Now you look at the human genome, there's, you know, 3.2 billion base pairs and about 30 million um, mutations or differences in any between any human. Mm. How do you find those little needles in that haystack? And the only way to really do that effectively is using computers. Yeah. But then what if you want to compare a thousand genomes against each other yeah. and look for disease types and phenotypes, uh, uh, um, you know, clinic, matching clinical data with those, those genetic changes? Then what if you want to uh, uh, compare that to um, the transcriptome or the RNA that comes from uh, different genes. Um, you know, the, you can't do this by hand anymore. And as computers are getting more powerful, bioinformaticians are pushing them to the limit. Mm. Um, honestly, before I knew about bioinformatics, the only other science I thought that really pushed computers was physics and astrophysics. Mm. Um, right. That's interesting. It's, uh, so bi bioinformatics... Uh, essentially programming enables us to do something that us biologists can't do? Uh, well, you know, you, you, you can think about it in your head and you know, kind of understand it, but how to, how to confirm that, right? How to have statistical power behind the results you're getting, mm. that, that takes 
some grunt work and, and, and specifically in programming yeah in yeah computer programming yeah so and you know some of the you know latest um changes in cpu architecture being taken advantage of by bioinformaticians right now mm. uh, some of the sequencing alignment tools like uh minimap 2 or bwa use the um uh, simd instruction sets to speed up how fast they can do computation and it's it's actually great but it, it's what's amazing. CMD? Sorry, I'm not a, I don't have a computer <laughs> background. I just got a little lost. What's CMD? Uh, so uh, my understanding is still a bit fuzzy on that as well. Um, but as far as I'm aware, it's a way where you can do multiple calculations in uh, in single cycles. Um, so you can speed up um, how you compute a particular answer. Mm. Just, we, we had a um, guest on a couple of weeks ago who... Um, is into neuromorphic engineering and we're talking about like deep neural networks or uh, do, do you see that coming into bioinformatics and, and oh yes yes so at the Garvin we actually have a um, deep learning initiative run um, by a guy named Tansel and he used to work in uh, programming self-driving cars and you know all this machine learning deep learning type stuff and um, his son was sick and um the the teams here actually helped figure out what was going on with him and helped um helped his son and uh he ended up um coming to work uh for for the Garvin when they asked him you know well, what, what what do you guys do and uh, what, what do you do and he he told them and um they're like oh you should come you should come work for us so he's uh he's looking at using deep learning to um uh, understand various parts of the genome and um how uh, we can, you know, there's there's questions that are just a bit too difficult at the moment for normal what we call dynamic programming. Um, so, I think he's currently looking at mitochondrial uh, disease, but um, it's it's rather fascinating. And Goog Google's even been having a go um, with their software called Deep Variant, um, which, as far as I'm aware, uses um, kind of like screenshots of uh, a genome browser. And because humans can see uh, individual changes, but it's, it was kind of hard to, to program. So they just used all the image recognition techniques ah, yeah. to do that wow. <laughs> instead, just like a human would. Yeah, and just, cool. and, yeah, and speed that up. So I, I thought that was a rather interesting technique. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit, because uh, I know you recently gave a presentation, I think it was at UTS, on um, open source yes. bioinformatics software. Because... Software, um, I think that's something that uh, you're a little passionate about and, and I'm particularly passionate about as well as the democratization of science and this kind of idea of open science about, which is maybe a little bit different to open source programs, but I guess um, open source bioinformatics is really putting scientific tools in the hands of ordinary people. Yeah, I think one of the best things about open source bioinformatics is that when I, when I get some data and I want to look at that data and get some answer out, um, I can actually understand how it's being handled because the algorithms aren't behind some black box. I can, I can see them, I can understand them, and I can then even extend them. Um, science is a collaborative effort, and if you're holding things back from people, it isn't a regression. Yeah, and yeah. You, you don't, you know, you never know where the next advance can come from. It could come from a, a high school student that was just passionate about a, and really interested in an area. Um, it could come from, you know, someone from a totally different field that, you know, saw these things and just had a had an interest on the weekends. Um, and I think open source allows for anyone to have a go. And, you know, that, I think that's what science isn't about, you know, people in their ivory towers mm. um, kind of disseminating knowledge from above. Yeah. It, science should be something that everybody can participate in. Yeah. It's a verb. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, uh, sorry, that reminds me of that. I'm sure you've heard of that kid who, uh, his grand was his godfather who developed, I think, prostate or pancreatic cancer. And then he went on some protein database and just searched thousands of proteins until he found one that he could then test for using some sort of nanotube of some sort. Have oh, you heard wow. that story? No, I haven't. That sounds really interesting. He, he gave a TED talk about it and how he was able to. I think he attached antibodies or whatever, but but the test was essentially like a thousand times cheaper, like some five hundred times faster, and it only cost of like two cents to do, and that wouldn't have been possible if that if that information wasn't available on the internet. Exactly. 
Yeah. Um, I guess the one before before I go, you, uh, I guess open source when it comes to that type of data, I mean, that kid was an exception. But is there like a, a barrier for... I just about to ask that question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I'm just going to steal your material. Yeah. <laughs> is there a barrier for normal people to kind of engage with that sort of data? Like a, no, a, no, a knowledge barrier, right? Because um, I guess... I guess, uh, and, and this might lead on to some stuff we might talk about uh, later with like education and things yep. like that. But I would imagine, because I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more about um, the importance of making science democratic, right? And getting it out to people because it's a collaborative effort. But then part of me thinks there, there must be some type of knowledge barrier there and some limitation that can make it difficult for somebody just stepping in out of the blue. Yes, I think there is a knowledge barrier, but I don't think it's all that more different to any other kind of field. I think one of the interesting things about bioinformatics is that if you can code, I think that's kind of where it starts. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, and then you bring in some other domain information like biology or any other real, any kind of science. Yeah. And then, you know, when you want to then test whether or not what you've done is r real or good, then you bring in mathematics and statistics. So there, are, there is definitely a way to break it down and build up that's those skill sets. And you can start really small and do some cool, interesting things. Um, you know, one of, one of my friends, he uh, was interested in, uh, you know, looking at, you know, you got DNA sequences. Is there anything you can do that's interesting with that? Um, and I, I was asking him if he wanted to make a quick little visualization. And he, he made a little JavaScript uh, visualization that just took a sequence and if it was an A, it went, uh, moved a little dot up. If it was a, a T, it moved it down. If it's C, left, G, right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you feed it a sequence and it makes little patterns on the screen. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's so simple. And it's just, you know, anyone that knows it's the, the coding behind it is really simple. You can do a simple coding um, course on something like Code Academy uh, and you can you can you can do these things. Um, then, if you want to learn some some more bioinformatics, you can go to something like Rosalind.info, and there they have just a whole bunch of problems that you can solve, and you can do it in any language. And it just it gives you a question, it gives you some data, you process that data, and then you give it the answer, and it tells you if you're right or wrong. Once you get it right, you can have a look at how everyone else solved it, and then you can learn and you can improve, and it's it's really interesting. It keeps track of all the problems you've done. I when what I teach, again? Sorry, just say that again. Yeah, so Rosalind dot info, yeah. and Rosalind Franklin, Franklin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good guess. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> How did you know? Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's that uh, wisdom that comes with age, I suppose. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, is that how you taught yourself, or did you actually take courses to learn bioinformatics? Um, I I don't think. Yeah, I think I'm a bit different to everybody else because I already knew how to program quite well. Um, I taught myself how to program uh, when I was a kid, and that ended up turning into uh, some work. Um, and then bioinformatics, I got a crash course. Um, and uh, shall, shall I tell that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so um, I, was, uh, I was working as a programmer for a company called Primary Healthcare. Um, they're a large pathology provider, um, Laverty Pathology in New South Wales, Dorovich in um, Victoria. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I went to a, a hackathon in, in um, ha uh, Wollongong called Hackagong and I met Meow um, and that basically changed my life. Um, and uh, I was really interested in, you know, what, what is this biohacking thing and what, you know, what are these biology suddenly interesting again? You know, I, I never really gave it much time in, in my um, previous studies or even at high school. And... Uh, I ended up, you know, going to a few hackathons and then my friend, uh, Laura, she invited me to a hackathon called Health Hack. And this was an open source um, hackathon, but it had a, had a bit of a twist where you have researchers that have problems and so they're problem owners and then they invite um, people to come be problem solvers. So you bring uh, your, your skills to someone else's field and try and see if you can help them out. Um, which is interesting in the field of bioinformatics because if you know computer science um, and you, you can 
code like a beast, then you could probably solve some of these problems. Yeah. Um, and I, I say that openly to anyone that knows how to code. You could come and you could you could do something really interesting um, in a very short period of time. Um, most bioinformaticians that I know didn't come from a mathematics or programming background. They came from biology and they learned the rest. Mm. Where um, there's very few that I know that came from the other way around. Mm. Though I think that's increasing now that we have actual bioinformatic courses at university. Um, so I came to Health Hack and I was on a team with Dr. Timothy Mercer. Um, and he's a group leader here. And um, he had a really interesting problem, which really intrigued me. It was, it was more, you know, command line based, you know, running some tools and analyzing some data. And he wanted to build something, something simple that could make, you know, one number into a smaller number, you know, to be rather vague. Um, but uh, I thought, well, that sounds like an interesting challenge. There's no front end development. I don't have to make anything pretty. It's just straight hardcore, like, algorithm you know coding this is that's what i really like i really get excited about elegant solutions to difficult problems yeah. and that's to me what an algorithm is right? a set of instructions to solve a problem yeah. in the simplest way possible so um we did that and it was a, a pretty wild ride there was a guy there who like made all the other scientists a bit nervous they ended up shutting our group down um, I didn't get much sleep because a, a friend of mine was really sick and then, you know, went in the next day and I kind of came up with a solution and, um, we were, we were, we were chatting and he's like, oh, that, that actually might work. And we had three hours to go, um, <laughs> to submit. And he's like, how fast can you code? So, uh, he developed some data. I, I wrote some a simple version of, of the code. We demonstrated it on a couple of variables and, uh, came out with a you know semi-workable solution, um, presented that, got third place, um, and he asked if I wanted to come do some more work with him. Um, it was a bit uh, challenging because I hadn't finished my degree yet. Um, I was still doing my undergraduate in physics, and uh, so that made things a bit difficult, but I spun it somehow and ended up working here one day a week um, doing a research internship. And then when that was done, um, I kind of uh, stayed on <laughs> with, with Martin in uh, John Maddox's lab. And then um, seven months ago, um, Martin started his own lab, the Genomic Technologies Group, and I started with him. And that's kind of where I am now. So my bioinformatics like learning experience and how I how now do what I do, I learned from these people, Tim Mercer, uh, the people in his group, um, and Martin Smith. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. Maybe, did you have something? No. Maybe it's a good time to actually talk about um, about that transition because one of the reasons I wanted to get you on the podcast is because you have a very atypical research journey. Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to get your thoughts about because so it sounds like. Well, I kind of know the answer to this, so I feel disingenuous <laughs> asking you. Like, but you you dropped out of your undergraduate degree, right? Yes, yeah. twice. Twice. Oh. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so why don't so, I guess why don't I just leave the floor to you? Why don't you tell us that story? All right, I'll give you the I'll give you the like cliff notes of my early life, if that because it kind of all ties together yeah. to where yeah, I start where wherever now. you want. So. You know, I was born. Um, and then, uh, but, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like my, my father was a, like, he's like a mechanic. He can like fix anything. Um, I think I had a lot from him being able to look at things and solve them really quickly. My mother's a teacher. Um, and, you know, the greatest thing they ever did when I was a kid was not crush my curiosity. I think that's like the one, th the one skill I, I, I have that drives everything. Absolutely everything I do is you know, it's funny, sorry to interrupt you, That's but it's fine. funny because I could probably say the same about Hamid um, at being very curious and I can say the same about me and we both have parents that are teachers as well. So I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe that's there's the something thing. There, yeah, maybe yeah, there's something yeah. there. It's just a correlation, but you know. Maybe they recognize, oh, let this kid do whatever he wants as long as he's <laughs> interested. You know, let's not squash yeah. that. Shit. Or maybe they're just so busy because teachers don't yeah, have much yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> like, just, they can't crack the whip as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not worth it. <laughs> they see so many helicopter parents that they just kind of hands off, you know. Well, I, I grew up in a time where I grew up in a different country as well, where my parents would just let us go and buy groceries at the age of like five or six. 
Whereas now, if you let like a ten year old go to the to the shops by themselves, like people freak out. They're like, "What are you doing? Where's your Where's your mom? Where's your dad?" You know. Yeah. And that's probably because of the internet. We know like how many creeps actually exist versus back then when. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was running around at eight, eight or nine on my yeah. bike all over the central coast, you know, and and no one really cared. So, yeah. but yeah, so um, yeah, they left me alone, so I I I didn't get my curiosity squashed, which is I think a. A problem with the current education system but um and i remember there was something my mother taught me that was probably the best lesson i ever learned but also it kind of broke me for formal schooling was uh i asked her a question one day and i can't remember what it was but she didn't know the answer and so she took me to our big you know um our bookshelf with all the encyclopedia uh, collection that we had on there back this is before the yeah, internet was no ubiquitous pre-internet pre, pre dial-up yeah, internet yeah. um and uh, she looked through the one. Well, you had a book that had the index of everything in the, all the other books. I'm explaining this because you know I, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm unsure if some people actually know how encyclopedias. Pretty safe guess, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's like Wikipedia, but there's you know there's yeah. an index. So, on paper. <laughs> yeah. So she looked up uh, what she might thought it where it might be where she might find the answer, and then she went to that book and she she read the information and went oh no i don't think this is it went back to the index went found, found the next thing that it might be went to there read it understood it and went ah oh, this is it then then explained it to me so i could understand and you know i thought i thought that was great that a she took the time to explain something to me and just go oh you know don't worry about it she actually she was trying to give me an answer because i was curious but what she taught me was that you don't actually have to remember the specifics of anything mm -hmm. What you need is to understand how it works, be able to apply it when you have that specific information, and then just remember the index. Mm -hmm. So you need to know things exist, how they work, but the actual specifics of them, you can just pull them up and then apply that knowledge whenever you need to. But I think there's very like uh, only a small amount of jobs in the world that require you to really have super specific knowledge at hand at all times, maybe a surgeon, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. And well, they'll all be replaced by robots in the future anyway. Well, but there, was, there was an article recently about, um, I think, a, a robot called Da Vinci, which mm -hmm. can do uh, surgeries, like keyhole surgeries that you would normally have to open someone up and that they're good within a, f a few days rather than months. Mm -hmm. so it, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this, this, this was a thing that I think it gave me tools that I now use every day but broke me for formal schooling. So, you know, my, my parents broke up when I was about seven and I went from school to school and, you know, my, my education was kind of disrupted, but I, I was picked on a lot and all this kind of stuff. But um, I found I was just bored at school. I, I ended up learning things very quickly, um, but I never, I never learned how to study. I never learned how to remember things. So in tests, I was abysmal, um, unless I, it was something I was just super interested in, like science. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, and but then any kind of project, anything where I had to build something or, or demonstrate a skill, and I could look up resources and apply them, I would knock out of the park, and that continued through into university. Um, uh, and you know, I started my university after you know eleven, twelve. Um, I took a break and went to Hungary for a year in exchange, but you know that was that was a, a different thing in my life. But. Um, and I was at I was at UTS and I was studying um, a double degree in mechatronics and applied physics. And I kind of wasn't really doing the the physics subjects at, at the time. They, they were kind of in, they, they overlap with the engineering ones. And it was super interesting. I did uh, the subjects where I got to build things, where I got to make stuff. And, and I did I did all right. And I, I, all those assignments I went really well. And all the theory um, <laughs> exams I failed <laughs> miserably. Um, and it wasn't from like a lack of trying. I, it just seemed to me that I, I, I tried, but I still had this thing in my head, which was like, why am I doing this? Why, why do I have to demonstrate that I, you know, understand something without any of the resources that I'd normally have? Mm -hmm. And that re it really frustrated me. I don't think it, I, I don't think it, ne it never really clicked. It went, you know, I'm, oh no, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it the way they want me to. Um, I do have a little bit of a penchant for. Um, not liking authority all that much, but, yeah. um, so, uh, yeah, that was, that was really hard and I was, you know, I didn't have much money, so I was working full time as well. So that didn't really, uh, wasn't very conducive to having good marks. And I eventually, um, I got, I got kicked out of, uh, that degree program. 
Um, so then for a year, I, I tried to join the Air Force to become a fighter pilot. Um, uh, that didn't work out. Uh, so I ended up going back and I, I re-enrolled. They, they let me back in to, to do uh, physics again. And uh, I was doing that part-time while working full-time. Um, I was working in, in a lab um, in pathology. Um, and that, that was great. Like, in science, and I think that kind of, you know, slowly put the seed of love for medicine and biology in my head. Um, seeing how, you know, an understanding of these things could lead to saving people's lives or, you know, making people's lives better. And um, how computers can, and, you know, programming can actually help that. Um, and speed that up and answer questions that are just a bit too hard for you to do on paper. And, um, you know, it was, I, w- I was kind of going through that and like, you know, I had the same problems with exams and, you know, some, some subjects, I did one subject, I got 100%. It was a programming subject. I wanted to know, am I actually any good? Apparently so. Um, and then, you know, in the same semester, another subject, it was just all exams, no practical work, and I got I don't even want to say what the number was, but it was, it was terrible. Um, and it's like, you know, there's this dichotomy of like, I can, I, I know I can do things. I, I know I can solve problems and answer questions. But at the same time, according to the education system I was in, I was, I, I can't. But so what, you know, you know, you, you want to, you don't like to think you're wrong. So obviously the system's wrong. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that like when it comes to everything I've learned, I honestly can't say that I learned a whole lot at university. Everything, everything I've learned was autodidacted. I, I, I taught myself and it was all from the internet um, or from other people who are really passionate about something that they're really good at and I learned from them. And, you know, I think um, when, when I think about education, I think, think we're stuck in an old mode of, um, you know, the teacher is an authority and or a tutor or a lecturer is an authority on a, on a subject mm-hmm. and they're disseminating information at you and you're expected to remember that information and then regurgitate that information mm-hmm. and you know fair play there are people who are trying to fix that mm-hmm. um my mother is one of them she's mm-hmm. now a principal of school and she's trying to change that um but this is still i think it's still scattered throughout various subjects within within university and, and high school and until we start changing to a model where it's, you know, um, collaborative learning and understanding and, and application without having to specifically remember things, it's, there's too much to remember these days as, as well. Like, there's way more knowledge than there ever was ever mm-hmm. before. And in a few seconds, that statement, you know, <laughs> continues to go. Yeah, exactly. So I think um, until we change our model of, of learning and teaching, um, we're going to keep producing graduates that, don't know how to actually problem solve, critically think, how to actually transition into the workplace. And, you know, like we have universities that say, you know, we make job ready um, uh, graduates. graduates yeah. But, uh, I mean, I've met those graduates. I've trained those graduates. Mm. And, you know, no, this is not just one uni specific because yeah. I have un, un, unwittingly singled one out. But um, <laughs> this, is, this is all graduates. And, um, you know, they get into the workplace and, you know, they don't understand they can, they can use Google, mm-hmm. right? They can have a textbook yeah. on their desk that they can look up. They can use the internet. I, I guess um, I'm about to like, in a week, right? I'm about to like go and uh, teach a first year science unit to, <laughs> to a whole lot of uh, kids coming in. And in typical plugging my own stuff uh, fashion, I'm going to be giving them this podcast to listen to. And your podcast is going to be first off the rank. So, <laughs> so, like, so, so what am I going to tell my students like when I walk into that class about, about why they should continue at uni? And now let me throw you a bone and give you why I reckon. Um, I reckon it's because sometimes you develop um skills at uni and i I, I look i agree actually agree with you on pretty much everything you've said oh (laughs) i I have a a big problem i do have a caveat that i haven't said yet yeah yeah well it might be yeah i might be kind of alluding to this caveat um i i think that you've acquired a certain set of skills that people can acquire through uni that would be my guess And, and um and and that's probably what I'll be telling my students, right? Yes. <laughs> is, is you're not here to get a piece of paper. You're not here to learn a bunch of facts. 
right? You're here to, de to develop skills to be a critical thinker. You're here to develop skills to do your own research and those types of job-ready skills, right? Yes. Um, and so, so what are some of the skills that you think that have led to your success? So you you've, you've, you've ducked out of the university system, yet you're still a very successful person. So, so what are those skills? You, you mentioned a few of them, but... Okay, yeah. so yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the caveat. Yeah. And, and that is that um, I think, m you know, no, nobody should do things the way that I've done things. I yeah. think that's the hard way of doing things. Yeah. Um, um, but I've never really done anything the easy way. Um, and, you know, if you are good at university or if, you know, you can get through that system, um, just try and maintain your curiosity, like keep that intact. Um, but yeah, university is a place where you can learn skills, where you, um, where you can um, become a critical thinker. But I think it's also another, another thing that university does is it, you, you, it allows you to create a network, it allows you to meet people who are also you know, interested in different things. And when they go off to different workplaces, you can you, you know people in different yeah. places and you can collaborate later. Which is something it sounds like the first half of this uh, discussion, you've been telling us about all the collaborations that you've made. Oh yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and so um, now to do with skills that I've learned that you can learn at university um, that have led to you know, some of my successes is um, you know the ability to not necessarily take what somebody says as gospel. Mm. That you know this is this is critical thinking. Can you take information um, that is given to you and compare it to other information that you've heard? and discern, you know, um, a question. Not necessarily discern what is true or what is not, but discern a question. Mm -hmm. and, and from that question, you can then go down a path to try and find that truth. Yeah. And I think that's too, too often we're told, you know, the whole fake news thing and like, um, you know, how do you discern right, uh, true from not true? Um, they miss the middle bit, which is, can you formulate a question? Mm -hmm. And I think that's like one of the skills that you need in, in science to be successful. Knowing is Knowing the right question to ask. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the way you do that is, um, you know, th this is a skill that, that a lot of lecturers will try and teach you, but I don't think many people are paying attention mm. um, because they're trying to, they're, they're focusing on what is the content, yeah. what's in the test, yeah. you know, what's, what mark do I need to get to, to pass right. in this, this, this test, you know, like, and, and the, the real you know, essence of what universities should be. Um, and I, I know a lot of people try to make it um, is lost because of that. Mm -hmm. And 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 honestly, to your students, and you know, people are gonna hate me for saying this, but um, marks aren't everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you can ask many of the lab heads here what their marks were like at university. Yeah. They'll tell you, not great. <laughs> 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 um, and I saw a Twitter thread just recently of really successful scientists that didn't have great GPAs, yeah. but, um, you know, showed interest, enthusiasm, and, you know, um, and the ability to, to think critically. And that's what people want in a researcher, yeah. in a scientist. That's the thing, right? Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but, and it's the same with the HSE. Um, your marks are actually meaningless once you get your first job, right? Once you get your first job, no one really cares how you did in, they care what you did in your job. They always care what you did in the last job you had. What was the, yeah. Well, I can tell you from every job that I've had to get, not a single one has been based on my academic marks because my academic marks have been terrible. Yeah. And so I apply through, you know, through HR and they throw my stuff in the bin yeah. because like, so who is this guy? Doesn't have a degree that like, you know, has terrible marks. Like, you know, why, why would we ever even consider him? Yeah. But then I apply directly to the hiring manager and they go, oh, I want to interview this. This, this guy looks interesting. Mm. And then I get the job. So, you know, it, there's some disconnect there that like if I'm if I can do things with terrible marks, I mean, that maybe that system isn't necessarily measuring people very well. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's interesting because um, I, I don't know if you've heard of PASS, which is a, it's a supplement, supplementary uh, instruction program that was developed in America. And essentially what they do, it's problem based learning. So. They set up classes and they get students to voluntarily come in and rather than that having that top down giving students direct instructions they give them a problem to solve and to collaborate with each other to solve those problems 
But in my experience, I've been doing that for several years. I find students like to play the university system in the sense that they want to do all the easy subjects and not challenge themselves in order to maintain those high marks. Oh, yeah. And what usually happens by the end of their degrees, um, they're just not, they're not prepared. They haven't challenged themselves. They don't know, uh, they don't have the confidence that, you know, they can take into the work place and say, hey, I have these skills, I've tested myself, I've pushed myself, I put myself in situations where I was uncomfortable and yet I was able to sort of like, in my undergrad, I did programming, I did Chinese, Japanese, philosophy, and my background is a biochemistry student. But like going to all those different, uh, uh, I suppose different fields uh, that were different from mine, um, gave me the confidence that, hey, if I just if I'm put in whatever situation, if I just apply myself, I can solve whatever problem is put in front of me. But a lot of students don't do that. And I think the issue also is that um, education systems like to test things that are easy to test for. Like, yeah. you know, the skills that you're mentioning, they are much harder to quantify versus here's a exam with 50 multiple choice questions and let's see how you do with that. Yeah. So it's interesting. So one probably one of the most interesting subjects I ever did at university was by um, a guy named Les Kirkup, and he was he was probably someone. Uh, and you know, I, I I rag on university a bit, but I I did learn. You know, I I met some rather amazing people when I was there, and friends that I'll have have for life. But there there was this this one lecturer, and he really got to me what the point of science is and how, how to do it well. And I have his textbook like on my desk here at work, right? Um, and uh, it, the, the subject was um, measurement and analysis of physical processes. I, I don't think it exists anymore, but um, uh, he, he taught me about Fermi problems. Um, and uh, I don't know if you know Enrico Fermi, but um, he, these, these questions where um, if you look at, I think it's like XKCD, there's like a what if section. Yeah. They're what if questions. So XKCD is the blog, isn't it? Or cartoon. Yeah, cartoonist. cartoon blog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know the Fermi paradox, but that's no. not exactly what you're talking about. No. Is it? Uh, so a Fermi problem is one where it's like, just think of something ridiculous um, and then try and actually solve it and get just get within the order of magnitude. It doesn't have to be the exact number. So it might be, um, I know one of the ones on the what if page is like, what if um, a baseball um, pitcher pitched a baseball at the speed of light? What, what would happen? Yeah. Right? And it talks about how it would start colliding. All the, all the atoms in front of the ball would start colliding and it would have a, like, a jet, like a heat ray that would you know, incinerate everything in front of it and then it would be basically a nuclear explosion. Okay. <laughs> There's, uh, um, you know, so we, had, we had a fantastic one, a few fantastic ones um, in this subject where um, they just give you some basic really basic um, starting sets of like, uh, of, a, of, a, um, of a scenario and you had to try and figure out what the answer was. Mm. And this was in one of our exams. Mm. Um, and we had a computer connected to the internet because you have to like go, okay, so let, let, let's say, um, uh, I think one of the ones I got was um, uh, how many, in your lifetime, how many atoms of, um, of a man's dying breath will you inhale? Mm. Right, um, and it's like, so you think about it. Okay, so in my lifetime, right, how many um, times do I breathe in a lifetime? Yeah. Right. How many times do I inhale? Okay. Um, so what kind of volume of air of that is that? You know. How many atoms is in that? Yeah. So it's like okay. So a man's dying breath. So let's say okay. Let's say let's just assume a full thing of like lungs of air, yeah. and then okay, how many atoms of that? You can use Avogadro, Avogadro's number. Um, you can then. Then you have to set your assumptions. Like, okay, we're going to assume yeah. homogeneity of like all atoms around the atmosphere, so it's like equally distributed, mm. no loss of atoms into plants or into space or you know any of that. And then you can kind of come to a number. Yeah. And the fact that you can come to a number is rather surprising, yeah. I think, um, for something so kind of left of field. But this is what scientists do every day. Mm. They they have this, they formulate that question that I was talking about. And then on the back of the envelope with a couple of Google searches, you can come to what would be a sane answer. Mm. Then you can go about trying to test it. Yeah. Um, those skills that make a good scientist. Yeah. It's not uh, learning all the different types of T cells. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. no. I, I actually joke with some colleagues here because they all do immunology and yeah. they're all rattling off all these terms and I'm just like, oh yeah, CD34, like yeah. you yeah. And, and they just kind of look at me like, what? <laughs> it's like, no, I have no idea what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, should we change the gears a little bit? Um, We've got to talk about James' as well, record. Yeah, well, that, that, thanks yeah. for stealing my material. You stole mine before, <laughs> so, so now I'm even, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, tell us that you, you hold the world record. Tell us about that. Well, unfortunately, we don't hold it anymore. Oh, um, when did that happen? This must have been incredibly oh, recently. Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is how exciting this area of nanopore sequencing is. Is you know, currently there's a huge race on the the bigger platforms that we get soon called the Promethean, yeah. and looking to see who can get the biggest yield out of a flow cell. Um, so I think they they in house they're getting like 150 gigabases out of one flow cell. And these machines can take up to 48 of them. Sorry, let's really quickly um, yeah, right. tell everybody what a flow cell is. Yeah, so on these nanopore devices, the things that can measure the ionic current of yeah. DNA or RNA, um, uh, the device that does that has, um, it's there's an array of these nanopores and then um, a bunch of uh, fluid channels that um, control everything around it. And then there's a little integrated uh, circuit that connects to, you know, basically a USB and that goes into a computing system and then we run all the analysis on it. So that unit with the, with the nanopores and the, the, the fluid channels, um, we call that a flow cell. Um, so and, and they have these small enough now, I think it's the smidge ion that yep. fits into a phone. Yeah, so this is how cool this stuff's getting, guys. Yeah, and yeah. there's a whole bunch of new things. These are things you, you can do the... Um, preparation to do sequencing in about 10 minutes and then you can be up and running on on a desk they've they've launched these into space on the international space station mm. um they and they can they can sequence things that other technologies um can't uh so yeah so they're doing this race of like flow cells with the promethean flow cells and trying to see who can get the biggest the biggest yield in the field like with the customers so in-house they're getting about 150 gigabases um, so it's 150 billion base um, bases um, out of these systems, and in the field, I think there um, people are getting around 90 gigabases. Um, so they're like slowly climbing, and you know this is it's really exciting. So in our one, we were we were looking at length. Who could get the longest single re like length of DNA to go through a pore, and you know we held the record at 473,000 bases at one point, um, and then uh you know someone else took it so there's it's been mostly three labs uh nick loman um uh, matt loose and martin smith um and mostly it's the people under them their phd students or you know in our case uh, kirsten button um who have been doing the actual <laughs> wet lab it's your record isn't it let's be honest our, our record yeah our record it's like, like it's a science it's a collaboration there's when, when everyone else, when anyone in science ever stands up and said i did yeah just always translate it into your head as we did, we, did. we did as a like rather large group and probably collaborations in other places so yeah. um but you know like you shouldn't take away from their glory they still work hard you know yeah. uh, so um yeah so then we 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 then got a read that was like 900 and something thousand bases um and then a new base caller came out so a software update came out um and it, this is the thing that turns those little um current measurements into the atcgs of, yeah. of dna and from a software update our nine hundred thousand or whatever base pair read went into uh over a megabase so like over over one million bases um which is insane the fact that you know you can we can like from a simple software update, you can you can get better information. You don't have to redo the experiment, um, which is amazing, for, especially for this kind of technology. Um, and that was recognized. We were the first people to to break one megabase. Um, and then within I don't know, it was like a week or two, um, Matt Luce came and smashed it with one point three megabases. Uh, and I think that's the current record. Yeah. Um, and uh, although I know that there are a few people out there. Um, coming for that record as well. Um, uh, yeah, so. That's cool. And, and um, we'll probably have to get permission of, from Martin to whack a picture of this on, but he had a quite a nice little poster 
uh, at the Lawn Genome <laughs> concert, uh, Conference. Why don't you tell us about his poster design and we'll stick it up on there. Yeah, so Martin Martin took a rather... Um, so just for those who don't know about posters and science, it sounds a bit like, you know, primary school stuff. But um, <laughs> if you ever remember making a poster about a particular topic, it's, it's actually exactly the same thing. But it, it's a rather interesting exercise for students um, or really anyone to demonstrate a certain area of research um, in a concise way. So you have a few figures, you have some text, um, and you're trying to explain your research. Um, and I've presented a poster now, which was a really good learning experience. And they're always really boring, aren't they? They always like <laughs> intro, abstract, yeah. method, results, discussion. Exactly. It's like a mini paper. Graphs. Yeah. Yeah. And like people try and change it up and yeah, like... They put the heading on the top and then the intro yep, and then yep. it flows down. And yeah. yeah. And sometimes you'll get someone that puts a iPad in there so you can like kind of do something interactive. Yeah. Uh, Tencel, the deep learning guy, he, he, he did that this, uh, this theory at Lawn. Oh, nice. But um, Martin decided to take a different tact. Um, and... He printed out our one megabase read um, at, I think it was point, uh, four point font, um, which by the way is a pain to print. Um, he printed it on two AO size which paper. Like the yeah, it's like yeah. 800 and something by 1.2 meters or something. Printed out two of those um, with a few little figures at the bottom. Um, <laughs> Uh, of that read and had a little magnifying glass and, and it was a, a, a rather alternative way of presenting um, you know but he said you know like welcome to the to the macro um, genomics revolution like we are looking at um, things where you know it's no longer these tiny reads we're talking like things and uh, someone on Twitter um, said that if your fist was the nanopore um, f uh, that the, that DNA went through the strand of DNA would be 3.2 kilometers long, oh, right? Just yeah. for, as a sense of scale. Yeah. And then, um, for the, and then if you think of the scale as if, uh, you know, there's about um, uh, 6.4 billion bases in the human genome because it's like you know base pairs, so you, you double it. Um, then if that's the uh, the population of Earth, uh, approximately, you know, maybe a while ago, but. Um, if that's population Earth, um, this particular read um, came from chromosome 19. Chromosome 19 is um, about the population of Italy. Um, and then, you know, the other kinds of sequencing technologies that only do short reads, their, their read length is about the populate, like the amount of people in a, a metro car or a, a train carriage. Um, this read is the population of Milan. Mm -hmm. Like just to, yeah, so you can get a sense yeah, of scale. Yeah. So, but it's still it was a, about two percent of, um, of chromosome nineteen, and just as a sense of scale to the whole human genome, it's still tiny. But it's particularly important as well. Like, why? Like, who cares if you get the longest read type of thing? But I guess it's really important when you're looking at things like long non-coding RNAs because they're yes. really long, <laughs> as the name suggests, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, rather than try and sequence them like you would have had to before in, in little parts and assemble them together, yep. you can get them in bigger lengths now. One of the biggest problems, it's kind of like, you know, Humpty Dumpty, where all the king's men and all the king's horses couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together yeah. again because it's the, it's hard to find overlaps where to, to, to string them together. Mm. Where when you have long reads and you have a lot of them, you can actually it, it, assembling um, where, what the original was becomes a lot easier. It's like little puzzle pieces, and you're trying to put it together. Easier, and uh, I'm guessing uh, more robust, for latter lack of a better term. Yeah, I mean, like there's there's caveats to the technology, point. but I mean it it can see things that other technologies can't better. So things like structural variations, where there's like large portions of the the um, genome that are rearranged. Um, there's a thing in cancer called chromothripsis where you have chromosomal bits of all different chromosomes all stitched together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're getting little pieces, then those bits just map back to those chromosomes. But when you get it in a single read, yeah. you know that that's like, that's an actual bit of DNA from a cell. Like, and how, like being, you can't just see, you can't really see this stuff in any other way. You need long read, long read technologies to do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just starting to see this information come out. And I think that's, that's fascinating. That's, that's um, where we're looking at a, at a new world like that's never been seen before just because of a new technology. And then on top of that, the bioinformatics to interpret it. That's cool.
kind of reaching that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. We've been going for what fifty three minutes. I think it's, it's almost time to wrap it up. Do you yeah, have, just, have anything else? I suppose a couple of questions. Uh, looking towards the future, um, do you think we'll ever get to a point where we can actually sequence the whole genome in one single read? Uh, single read, no. Um, mostly because that's not because uh, you have you have twenty three chromosomes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that was a dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> well, twenty three reads. So say a chromosome. Then. No, well, okay. So that's that's for you know things like humans. Mm. If you're talking about bacteria, we already have. So um, I, I can't quite remember what it was, but um, I'm semi-confident that someone has already captured uh, an entire, I think, E. coli, because um, circular genomes, yeah. right? Um, so you snip it open and then get the whole thing. Mm. So they got like 99% of it, I think, in one, one read. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, uh, looking into the future, what are you most hopeful for and what are you most afraid of? Yeah, that can be, that can be, because we've discussed a lot, right? So that can be technologically based, that can be education based, that can be just something totally out of left field, because I know you have a lot of very diverse interests. Yeah. You've got a Feynman shirt on there for starters, so, you know. <laughs> so, so what am I most, sorry, can you just repeat that question again so I make sure I get so it right? So uh, looking into the future, what are you most hopeful? Hopeful. And afraid of afraid of yeah. let's start with afraid because i think you know like it's in on high yeah no. yeah yeah so, so fear, like, let's do the scared one first fear is like yeah. a thing so you know i i see the world as it is now and you know we look at how politics is interfering with science um and how politics is interfering with knowledge and what is true and that opinion is taking over um what people see is true that um, you know, anyone can have an opinion and they're all valid. Um, I take a kind of hard line on that and I know a lot of people disagree with me, but no. Like, sure, you can have an opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Um, and I think that I, I'm, I'm fearful that that will continue and it's going to erode the basic principles of how we do critical thinking in society and, and in all realms. Um, you know, I, I, I've been part of the science party for a while um, because they try to look at um, creating policy from evidence rather than ideology. Um, and, you know, th th these are things that I, I find worrying in, in, in the way that I look to the future. However, then I see people like Elon Musk um, who, you know, just launched a car into space and landed two rocket boosters simultaneously like... Um, and uh, sold, was it 20,000 or 10,000, I, I can't remember, uh, flamethrowers in a couple of days uh, <laughs> from a joke, right? It's like, but but is pushing the boundaries and, and can kind of take things not so seriously, right? And, and can push science in a way that's like, um, that I, I never thought people could do. You know, you, that you could push science and have a lot of fun at the same time. Okay. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I was having a really hard time just a week ago. I had, like, the first panic attack of my life ever. Um, and I was really freaking out. Um, I had a lot of pressure on me. I, I had a presentation to do, and, um, and I was going to that conference. Um, and that next morning, um, Elon Musk launched the, the Falcon Heavy. And I remember I, I was on the train. I was watching, like, the launch. And I was, like, filled with hope, like we can do this. Like we can, like there are people out there that can solve problems that everyone says you, it can't be done. Yeah. You will never succeed in making a privatized space, space company. Like, yeah. um, and I got to work and went, you know what? I, I can do this. Right. And I can, I can push, push forwards. And I think mentorship like that, like, you know, he, he's like a, someone that I, I admire, but mentorship can change like the perceptions and outcomes of people like nothing else. And you know, I, I want to thank all my mentors, like Martin, Martin Smith, and John Maddock, and Tim Mercer, and you know my friends. Like we all push each other to kind of achieve things that everyone else says can't be done. And I think if more people could do that, I, I think we have a very hopeful outlook for for everybody. And and perhaps we can get past those fears that I just mentioned. 
So that's awesome, man. Really good. Yeah, I was reading actually just to end on this. I was reading uh, Elon Musk's autobiography. I need to read that. Oh, <laughs> it's really good. Well, he actually wanted to um, send a rocket to Mars to get public to uh, get the public interested in science, but th th a bunch of shit went wrong, and then he changed, and now he's got you know what he's got now. So that's really cool. What? Well, there was one thing that I found that was fascinating was that people were saying, oh, you know, why would you send a car to space? That's like, you know, what a waste. Like, it's not even a scientific payload, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, some astrophysicists were like, hold my beer. Mm -hmm. And they've been looking at the, as the car spins in space and the, the whole thing, um, they've been using like the brightness changes and everything to look um, and try and use the algorithms they use for looking at asteroids and determining their shape to do the same thing for this car, but it's a known structure. So they can test and benchmark all their so methods. they can verify that their methods are actually working on Precisely. Yeah. So so just <laughs> it, it undermines the, um, uh, sorry, it reinforces the ability of scientists to kind of always find a way to use any information to like exactly. gain and, knowledge. And I thought that yeah. was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I saw this brilliant. wonderful Twitter um, Twitter conversation of people. And then and, and because everyone just went, oh, I'm going to have a go at that. And there were people like from all over the world in this one conversation going, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder if we do this, this, and this, and then posting some data for everyone to kind of look at. Yeah. It's like this collaborative thing. And I think that that's why I love science. It, it brings people together. It doesn't matter your nationality, your culture, yeah. your religion, or anything. Science is universal. Science, you know, bridges those gaps. And like, if, if people just have curiosity and want to know, want to understand, you can, you can, Triumph over any any other problems. That's awesome. Take that, flat earthers. <laughs> 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 All right, I think we'll end it there. Thanks, yeah. Thanks a lot, awesome. James. It was awesome. Cheers. Nice. Thanks. See you later.